All right, so let me start recording. So our main focus on today's lecture for civic education is uh, governance systems in Zambia. So as usual, I recommend that uh, after this lecture, I'm going to send you the lecture video. You should start writing down the notes and use this lecture video uh, to study. So last time we talked about uh, a constitution, we were able to define a constitution. We talked, uh, we gave a brief history of our constitutional systems in Zambia. Then we were able to break down uh, a constitution into four components. We said um, we have a written constitution, an unwritten constitution, a rigid constitution, and a fixed constitution. We were able to define things like uh, merits of a good constitution and demerits of a good constitution. So you have to go back, you have to make sure you know all those things because they might come as an essay or they might bring them in some form of um, multiple choice questions. So make sure you write down the notes. So our main Our main focus for today is on governance systems in Zambia. All right, so governance, we have to know the definitions. I told you civic education is about knowing the right terminology to use and finding associations between those terminologies and trying to make sense uh, of those terminologies with what's happening in Zambia. So you're applying, you're knowing this, uh, the terminologies and you're trying to apply the terminologies even if you forget uh, this amount of information, once you know specific types of terminologies, you can be able to write down something. So practically, governance just means the way people are ruled. So there are practically two types of governments, but right now we are mostly concerned in uh, looking at what democracy is and criteria for citizenship and characteristics of good governance. We're going to look at detect, uh, dictatorship much more in detail, probably in our next lecture. But right now, we're uh, more interested in the democratic part of the governance definition. So governance just means how people are ruled. It can be a dictatorship type of rulership or a democratic type of leadership, but just how people are ruled. As usual, uh, before each and every lecture, before we come to the current uh, happenings, we have to look at a brief history of what used to happen in the past. So pre-colonial, you know, before we were um, ruled by colonial rule, we had kingdoms, you know, the Lozi Kingdom, the Bemba Kingdom, and uh, it Luba Lunda, it, it is, you know, a lot of kingdoms, and these, we had chiefs uh, who were uh, uh, we had chiefs and sort of chiefdoms. We had uh, headmen and headwomen, uh, fathers and families, and all this was sort of a primitive sort of governance system that was ruled mainly on a, a cultural and religious beliefs by these chiefdoms. But the only difficult part about this period is that their justice, their justice system was sort of fraud because sometimes, you know, if someone is found guilty of a crime, they are meant to do serious labor in a field where there are a lot of passers-by, where people can sort of see them pass. Um, people are passing, uh, they are seeing them work. At times, it got so extreme in these uh, uh, primitive pre-colonial sort of chiefdoms such that if someone is found uh, stealing, they'll cut off your fingers. Or if someone is actually accused of witchcraft, you know, witchcraft was a big deal back then, or it's still a big deal even up to now, but it was such a big deal such that someone who was accused of witchcraft was actually burned. That's how bad the justice systems were in the pre-colonial days. However, the colonial administration came through and they introduced a new system of, govern, uh, of government in Zambia and a new system of governance. But the only bad part about the colonial system is that all elected officials were elected by uh, the queen. 
uh, in England. So we had no type of um, decision. We were not part of the decision-making process uh, back then. So it wasn't fully demo uh, democratic. It was mostly a colonial sort of dictatorship kind of rule. So that's the history. But now we, uh, Zambia practices something known as good governance. So in Zambia, we now have good governance systems. Are we together? Yes. All right. Uh, tell me if I'm not uh, audible enough because I want to be audible enough so that you can get this thing properly. Am I audible enough? Yes. All right. So after this history that I've given you, Zambia now, we now practice a good governance and there are certain characteristics of a good governance. So by the way, these are questions. So they can say, define governance. All right, okay, this is how uh, people are ruled. It can either be a democracy or a dictatorship. You answer like, okay, I'm getting something here. Then the question falls and says, uh, what are some of the characteristics of good governance? What is the importance of good governance? So each and everything that we're doing here is very important. You are not supposed to memorize everything, but at least you have to be able to understand so that you can answer what you can remember. If you understand, it will be easy to remember. So good governance. So good governance means a governance which is authorized, uh, uh, a government, which is in authority is, legit, is legitimate and respects democratic principles such as respecting the rule of law and also human rights. So we have got two definitions here. So for a governance to satisfy the definition of good governance, it has to obey two things, the rule of law and human rights. So what exactly is this uh, rule of law? So uh, the rule of law, you have to write down this definition when uh, you get the video and you start writing the notes. So the rule of law, it's a legal principle, practically the biggest legal principle that we have uh, here in Zambia or in each democratic country. So the rule of law is a legal principle that suggests that no one is above the law. And the governmental decisions must be made only by applying non-legal and moral principles. So you cannot change the government, you cannot adjust the law uh, in your own opinion. The rule of law is meant to prevent one dictatorship and it's also meant to protect the rights of the people. So no one is above the law. No one can change uh, the law without passing through legal and moral principles. And it, it serves to prevent dictatorship and above all to protect human rights. You who wants to go in the police force, you have to know what the rule of law states. And you also have to know the definition of human rights because once you enter the police force, it's the human rights that you're going to be uh, protecting and you have to know what governance is. So civic education has to be on your fingertips if you want to enter the police force and if you want to become uh, a proper police officer. So what are human rights? So human rights are practically, they are just rights that you aim, that you gain just by simply existing as a human being. So as long as you are alive, you, have human rights, it's, it's a born right. So human rights are just naturally born rights. They are not granted by the states. These are universal rights. Uh, they are inherent to just us, you know, regardless of your nationality, your sex, um, your ethnic, your, your color, your religious background, the language you talk. And these can range from just the basic, the fundamental human rights, for example, the rights to, to life, and to those that make living, uh, you know, worth living, such as food, education, work, and health, and also liberty. So that's practically the definition of a human right. So good governance has to follow the rule of law, and it has to be able to prevent dictatorship and protect human rights.
So that's what good governance uh, is all about. So now you may ask, what is actually the importance of good governance? So one, the big one, it enables citizens to enjoy full human rights and freedoms. Why? Because we are, um, the rule of law stands. So it enables citizens to enjoy full human rights, makes the government accountable, no excuses. We all, this, if things are not going well within a country, the citizens need someone to blame. And who, who is there to blame? The government. The government has to be accountable. If there's a good governance system, uh, it makes the government accountable. Uh, citizens can vote out leaders who fail to perform. So good governance is a good democratic system that enables the citizens to choose their leaders willingly or even demote them if they are not performing to a specified standard if the economy isn't uh, doing so well. The rule of law is respected. So that's the importance of governance. And anyone has the right to contribute towards making the constitution. As long as you are a Zambian citizen, you have the right to contribute towards making of the constitution of the country that you are living in. So that's the importance of a uh, good governance. So this heading here, it actually reads characteristics of good governance. And these are some of the uh, terminologies that you have to know uh, because civic education has a section where there is like a short answer question or you just have to write a phrase or a one word answer. And these are sort of the terminologies that you have to know it can come as an essay. What are some of the characteristics uh, of good governance? 10 marks, 20 marks, what do you write? So the first thing that you have to say, characteristics of good governance, uh, bulletin number one, uh, separation of powers. So we have these uh, three organs of the government that have to be able to work independently the executive, judiciary, and legislature. If you remember, there's that table that we spoke uh, about in the previous lecture, uh, talking about the organs of the government or the structure of the constitution. And these are the three organs of the government. The executive, that's concerned with elections, tenure of uh, office, uh, the amount of time someone's supposed to be in office, and removal of president from office, are functions of the president and ministers, the legislature, you know, qualifications for election to national assembly, legislative powers and membership uh, of uh, members of parliament, and these, the lawyers, the, judici uh, the judicature, deals with courts and appointments of judges. So these are the three wings of government, and they have to be able to operate are uh, independently of each other. No, who am I? They have to be able to uh, operate independently. So checks and balances. Despite these three wings of government in um, working independently, they have to be able to check on each other to ensure that they are actually carrying out the functions uh, adequately to have a good constitution and a good governance system. So this term is actually uh, referred to as checks and balances. So this is where the judiciary, the executive and the legislature, the three uh, organs of the government check on each other to promote democratic governance. So if there's an election uh, going on, the legislature can actually check on um, the executive system to ensure, oh, are, are you carrying out your election uh, uh, processes well? So they can actually check on each other. They are not, in as much as they are independent, they are also interdependent. They have to be able to work together and check on each other to ensure and to promote uh, democratic uh, processes. So there's also something known as political tolerance. So this means that people with different political opinions must be able to freely 
express their views. If an opposition party wants to have a press conference where they are trying to educate the public about their new ideologies and have different views, uh, different from the current government, they have to be freely able to express their views. No poli police people have to come and say, oh, opposition leaders, let's arrest you. This isn't good governance. Good governance calls for political tolerance. Our characteristics of governance, we did mention the rule of law. I'm sure now you know what the rule of law means, right? Yes. So let's just go over it again. So this means no one is above the law. Uh, all those in power must rule according to the constitution and other laws of the country. And we did mention that here the rule of law is there to prevent one dictatorship and it's also there to ensure that all human rights are protected. So we also have fairness. So fairness, this means that a good government should make sure that no one is excluded from access to any public services for reasons. Uh, for example, gender, your mental or physical disability, no, um, or any religious uh, affiliation, you're not supposed to be discriminated. If you're a woman, you have to vote. If you belong to a certain, if you are a Zambian and you're Muslim, you can still vote. Doesn't matter your gender. If, if you are on a wheelchair, you can still vote. As long as you are a Zambian citizen, it has to be, it, the democracy has to be fair. Sorry, the governance has to be fair. So characteristics of good governance, I keep on mentioning the heading so that the heading should stick into your brain because these headings are actually used as questions, as essay types of questions. So characteristics of good governance, it has to be helpful and caring, uh, a helpful and caring. A government, a good government should be helpful and care for the interests of citizens at home and also abroad. So just doesn't, just doesn't mean that, all right, if I go abroad, I cease to be a Zambian citizen. If you are still abroad, the government has to care for you well enough to facilitate your arrival back to the country. And if you are abroad, should find ways of you being able to vote for new political leaders, regardless of your geographic location. So remember, Good governance means good democratic system. So they have to be the existence of political parties. So they should exist and operate under democratic principles. They also promote uh, checks and balances. Remember what checks and balances are? The three organs of the government, the judiciary, the legislature, and the executive, they have to check on each other to see whether they are performing uh, their functions properly to allow for good governance. So these political parties, like I said, if there's an election, the judiciary can check on the executive and vice versa. So the existence of these political parties allow for checks and balances, but existence of political parties is also a good characteristic of uh, good governance. So regular free and fair elections so a good government should have a periodic free and fair election. So I think this one is self-explanatory. For good governance, they should be free and fair elections. So remember, um, when we spoke about good governance, we mentioned something called accountability. So accountability and transparency is also a characteristic of good governance. So what uh, does accountability mean? So accountability means that leaders should be answerable to the citizens who elected them into office. So answerable, accountability, who's responsible for the failing economic system in Zambia. A citizen can pose such a question and someone has to be accountable. And the person who has to be accountable are the people who the citizen has elected into office. Transparency means no secrets. So the public resources must be used uh, for government and community programs in consultation between the government and the citizens. 
this is uh, what I was talking about, no secrets, there should be openness in the use of public resources. Where is our money going? What's the, uh, the national budget has to be uh, easily accessed to all citizens so that each and every citizen should know how resources are allocated within their own country. So accountability, who's responsible for this? Transparency, no secrets, no keeping secrets. The government, the citizens have to know, they have the right to know. So where there is a good govern government or good governance system, there's an opposite to that. There are always uh, bad governance systems. Are we together, by the way? Yes. Civic education makes me talk too much because, you know, it's mostly notes and I have to be able to make it interesting so that as you are studying these notes, you at least have a video to guide you through this book. And we're still there, look, we're on page seven of 148. So we really have to, we have to move. At least if we can reach a hundred, I'll be happy. And as we reach a hundred pages, you also have to be able to be able to have full mastery of this content. Uh, have you been downloading the videos? Yes. All right, okay. So characteristics of uh, bad governance. So bad governance is the opposite of good governance. So it means a, govern, a government that does not follow democratic principles such as adhering to the rule of law, such as not respecting human rights and the rule of law. Remember the rule of law, it's um, human rights. So uh, uh, no one is above the government. So uh, human rights and no dictatorship. So if you are not uh, respecting human rights and the rule of law, and you are not legitimate, you just wake up and say, all right, military guys, let's take over the government, let's do a coup. That's uh, not good government. And you know, the whole country just becomes under martial law dictatorship full blown so it doesn't respect human rights it does not respect the rule of law and these are the following uh, characteristics of bad governance so again uh, this can actually be a question what are maybe they can start it like this a uh, good gover uh, governance is the way in which people are ruled good governance means uh, protecting uh, human rights and adhering to the rule of law. Mention some of the characteristics of bad governance. Boom, they have posed the question like that. You start saying, okay. oh my goodness, what's this? So you really, you have to be able to, as you are reading, you have to analyze, can this come as a question? All right, I'm sure this can come as a question. I have to know this. I, I, at least I know what, bad, what good governance is. I can now try to piece in the pieces together and just say the opposite. So for example, in good governance, there was separation of powers between the three wings, the judiciary, legislature, and the executive, meaning in bad governance, there's lack of separation. So lack of separation of powers, a lack of citizen participation. You are not allowed to vote. You are not allowed to change the constitution. You don't have an opinion. So lack of citizen participation and neglect of public welfare. It doesn't matter if there are, if there are no, if there's no food security in the country, if there are no, uh, if there isn't any good water and sanitation system in a certain area and no rural electrification, it doesn't matter. They just neglect uh, uh, public welfare. Irregular and unfair elections. Maybe there can even exist a one-party system, you know, sort of a dictatorship, just irregular and unfair elections, and no freedom of press. There is only one new station in Zambia. Imagine if there was only one new station in Zambia, and all these other new stations are not allowed to say anything bad about the govern, uh, government. That's a characteristic of uh, bad uh, governance a restriction of political activities. Oh, this political party is planning a rally somewhere else. Go and arrest them, put them in jails. So that's the restriction of political activities. Uh, human rights are violated. 
so violation of human rights all right yeah women you are not allowed to vote no women are supposed to join the military uh, women are just supposed to be in the kitchen uh, no education for girl child so this a bad governance will be able to violate basic human rights uh, the judiciary is not uh, independent maybe even the leader of that political party is the one in charge of the judiciary so he can determine who is supposed to be arrested without even a court order and that's the definition of an arbitrary arrest arbitrary arrest it means you haven't even done anything it hasn't even been proven that you've committed a crime someone who's above the law just says go and arrest that person 10 year sentence without any proof that's called an arbitrary arrest so you are or arbitrary detention you are detained for like one week for no reason just to teach you a lesson so these are the, an arrest or a detention of an individual in a case in which there's actually no likelihood or no evidence that they committed a crime against the legal uh, uh, state, or in which there has been no proper due process of law or order. So like I said, you haven't done anything, you're just minding your own business, trying to arrange a political rally, boom, this person has just been arrested. So that's what's called an arbitrary arrest. So let's now uh, talk about uh, electoral systems. How are we supposed to elect uh, a leader? Uh, by the way, are we together? Yes. All right. So electoral systems. So electoral systems are part uh, of good governance. So what are electoral systems? So these are methods by which citizens, this is a key word here, citizens. If you're not a, a citizen, you cannot take part in electoral systems. So these are methods by which citizens choose their leaders and representatives. So that's what an electoral system is. How are we going to choose our leaders and representatives? And uh, there are four main methods by which different countries around the world um, elect their leaders and representatives. So here's a table that summarizes uh, these uh, four different methods. How do we elect our leaders and citizenships? What are the various scenarios? So the first one, the first electoral system one, is a single member plurality system or first past the post system. Wow, these definitions. And I'm not the one who's uh, doing civic education, so you have to know <laughs> You have to know these uh, things, but uh, it's okay to just say single member plurality system because here the candidate who scores the highest uh, wins. This is what Zambia does. We have our elect electoral commission and people casting their votes, and you know it's broadcasted on TV, and the person who has um, the highest number of votes wins. That's what we do here in Zambia. So single member plurality system or first pass the post system. Wow, this is, this is a mouthful to say. But if you don't remember this, at least you can remember single member plurality system. So single member majoritarian system. Uh, this one is sort of practiced mostly in the USA. If you have a lot of college votes, they can stop, they can just elect someone as the winner. Maybe even they, are, they have not even finished counting all the votes, as long as you just have a 50 plus one. So candidate who scores 50 plus one or 50% and above of all votes cast wins. So they have to have statistics. They have to know the total number of uh, uh, people who've registered as votes, uh, uh, as voters. And then if you just go beyond the 50% threshold, so 50 plus one, someone will be able to be uh, elected uh, as the leader or the representative. So I, I think that the USA is the one that 
uh, practices something that's similar to this, the single member majoritarian uh, system. So what's this uh, proportional representational system? Proportional, represent, uh, proportional representational system. Sorry, these, these sort of terms are a little bit of a mouthful, but once you get the study and the practice, it will be actually easy to even um, make a correlation of understanding. So use a party list. So you have a party list. So upon uh, that party list, you have parliamentary seats are, are given according to that to what a party has obtained in an election or a percentage. A leader of a party with the highest votes forms a government. So this is very much democratic. So you have a party list, then the citizens go and vote. And based on those election percentages, the party that has the highest votes is the one that's going to form a government. So also Zambia sort of practices uh, this sort of list because citizens are given a list of candidates and we vote. So this is the one that I was interested in, the mixed member proportionality system. So mixed member proportionality system. This is where you combine this first one here. And so you combine one and three. So where you have a list, this a list of parties, and then you vote for that list of parties. And then the candidate who has the highest score is the one who is going to be elected. So this is what Zambia has. So the electoral system that Zambia has is a mixed member proportionality system. I'm going to say it once more. So mixed in that it's a combination of the single member plurality system and the proportional representative system where we have a list of eligible political parties and then that list is presented to the people and then people go and vote then the candidate who has the highest score wins and they'll have uh, they form the new government so remember this the first one single member plurality system or first past the post candidate with the highest votes wins single member majoritarian system the votes uh the winner is announced immediately. The 50% is, is, is uh, above 50%, so 50 plus one. If there are 100, uh, so 50 plus one among the total, if someone just goes above 50%, that's the winner. A proportional representational system, this is where there is a list, and the one with the highest percentage from that list forms the new government. Then there is a mix. A, a, a mixed member proportionality system which combines this one the highest was the highest votes wins and the citizens are given a list are we together yes all right so let's now talk about uh, citizenship what a citizen is what um the characteristics of a good citizen and criteria for citizenship if someone is not uh, a citizen, or maybe you are not born in Zambia, or maybe you become a citizen uh, through marriage, or you've lived in the country for more than 10 years. So, and so that's what we're going to talk about. So let's now focus on citizenship. So definition of citizenship. So citizenship is the relationship between uh, an individual. So that individual is the citizen and the state he or she belongs to. So the state is the country uh, of origin. So the relationship that the individual has with the state, the state means the country he or she belongs to. So that's what citizenship means. So a citizen is a member of state. Remember state is country. So a citizen is a member of state who enjoys all rights and privileges granted by that particular state and is able to perform the duties of the state. Allegiance is the readiness of a citizen to protect his or her country in terms of threats and be able to do the duties of a citizen. So 
you have to, as a good citizen, one of the characteristics of a good citizen is allegiance to your country. Uh, same with patriotism. You have to be proud of your country, but again, you have to be able to defend your country against uh, any, any threat. Uh, nowadays, we're not usually worried about uh, war because the world is going towards a global peace. But the major threats to governments now are mostly online systems where, you know, as the whole cyber bullying, etc. your country is this, this. So you, you have to be able to have that duty to protect your country, even in the case of war. So uh, citizenship has got two aspects. So you have got the legal aspect and you also have the moral aspect. This is intrinsic to uh, the moral principles that uh, a, an individual citizen has to have. So legal aspect, a citizen is recognized by the laws and he or she must receive the protection from his or her state, both within the state and abroad. So whether you are abroad, you have to be able to fully enjoy the rights and freedoms as a Zambian citizen, um, whether you are abroad or not. So the law has to be recognized and you have to be protected by the law. Uh, a citizen under the legal aspect must enjoy total freedom from uh, property and political uh, rights. When one misuses this freedom, an individual is liable for uh, persecution. For example, if you, you, are, you are at a school, you are enjoying those facilities, you know, right to education, you are enjoying the school facility, and then you start vandalizing the school. So that goes against the rules of uh, a good citizen, you know, vandalism. They install good traffic lights and robots in the streets and you're enjoying those facilities and you just start destroying those um, uh, installments. So that would be illegal if you are, if you are misusing those uh, freedoms, you will be liable for persecution. So that's the legal aspect. So one, you have to enjoy all the rights and freedoms within your country, whether you are in the country or abroad. And you also have to enjoy all the facilities that your country has to offer within limits. If you go beyond limits, you start vandalizing stuff, uh, you will be subject to prosecution or arrest. So liable, you, you are subject to being arrested. So liable for persecution means you can be arrested if you go beyond limits. So let's now talk about uh, the moral aspect. Uh, so this means that a citizen must have a sense of responsibility. You know, you have to have responsibility for being a citizen in, uh, in your country to fulfill all the duties uh, given by the state. So this includes the duty to obey the law and defend the country. So defend the country, uh, that's what we uh, talked about in terms of allegiance, uh, you have to be able to defend your country and you also have to be able to uh, obey the law. So moral aspect also encourages a citizen to be self-disciplined and have self-control. You know, this is my country. Why should I start vandalizing stuff? So he or she must have good and honorable sense to the state and the family he or she belongs to. So citizenship also, it goes beyond uh, the country, but it also, citizenship is also found inside your, your households, you know? You have to obey certain rules set uh, by the people who you live with so that you can live together in harmony. So here the citizen, uh, the citizen enjoys the rights given by the state like defending the country, taking part in political activities, uh, ETC. So let's talk about aliens. So when I say aliens, I don't mean uh, out of space, other planets, uh, weird creatures, no. 
when we talk about alien, so this word was actually adopt, uh, adopted by movie agencies to mean beings that are found probably in other planets and they make these weird movies where they show aliens, like, you know, Avengers, you know, Batman and Superman, they show these weird aliens. But alien in civic education, don't start saying an alien is uh, a, a creature that belongs to Mars or Pluto or something like that. Do not say that. That's not civic education. In civic education, uh, an alien is a person staying in a country. So you are staying in a country which is not his or her own. So if you go to the States, Mwapasa, grade 12, then you decide to uh, get a nice job and you become an expatriate uh, in the States, you are going to become an alien in the, in the USA. So an alien is practically synonymous to a foreigner, but a foreigner, that's another definition. A foreigner means you have fled the country and you are seeking asylum because of maybe war or uh, political instability in that country. But if you're an alien, you're just going there, maybe you're an expatriate, maybe you're a, uh, maybe you are a tourist, or maybe you've gone there because you, are going, you found a job, a short-term job, so you're going there to make some money, or you're going there for business. So you become an alien in that country. So you're in a, a country that's not yours. So the country in which an alien is found is known as the host country. So because you are in that country, they are hosting you. You are not practically a citizen, but they are hosting you as an alien so that you can legally finish whatever it is that you've come to do in that country, then legally and peacefully exit the country. So when we are talking about, we're not talking about foreigners or creatures from other planets, we're talking about someone who's just come to that to, to a country that's not theirs maybe for business or for work or they are an expatriate that has been sent by the other government so an alien does not enjoy all the rights such as voting so you're not there to vote or change their political system so why should you vote so you don't enjoy uh, all the rights of, of that country However, all foreigners enjoy, you know, civil rights, you know, right to use public uh, facilities, uh, you, you know, the, the, the civil rights, rights to freedom of expression. Uh, all foreigners enjoy these rights, but they, not, they do not vote. So an alien, like I said, should obey all the rules of the host country. Again, the host country is the country that's accommodating you. So if you are in the USA as an alien, the USA is your host country. So when an alien misconducts himself or herself by not obeying the rules of the country, such as paying tax, he or she can be deported uh, to their own country. So if you are not paying the, the, the legal tax, maybe your passports, is starting to expire and you do not want to renew your passport and you go in hiding once they find you they'll be like oh this person hasn't renewed their their passport moreover they are not even paying tax they are not following our country uh, uh, rules and laws send them back to their country uh, though an alien should pay tax as a duty he or she he or she is not duty bound to take arms to defend the host country so here there is no, uh, what term did we use? Uh, allegiance. So you have no allegiance to that host country. If there is any sign of war, you just pack your bags and go. No allegiance, You're not a citizen there. Just straight to the next uh, airport, run away if there is war. You don't have an allegiance. You don't have to uh, defend that country. So we've talked about uh, citizenship as a definition. Um, the characteristics of uh, citizenship. We've talked about government. So let's now zone in back to citizenship. Remember the definition of citizenship is a relationship that an individual has with the state. So that relationship is subject to different 
are types of variations. So these are the variations that we want to talk about, the kinds of citizenship that exist. So there are two types of citizenships, namely natural citizen, where you are born in that country, or naturalized citizenship, where certain circumstances have led you to become a citizen of that country. So you are an alien initially, and then over time you become a citizen. That's what it means when they say naturalized citizen. But a natural citizen, you know, very natural, uh, you become a citizen. For example, certain people are naturally brown, right? They are naturally light-skinned. Yes. And then there are those people who start, you know, they start getting their carolites, they start looking sort of maroonish and natural, naturalized, light-skinned people. So certain circumstances have led them to having this uh, light skin. So it's synonymous to, to that. Other people are naturally born citizens and other people are initially aliens then certain circumstances have led them to becoming citizens. So let's talk about uh, this natural, uh, natural uh, citizenship. So one can become a natural citizen. So these are the uh, criteria for you to become a natural citizen. So uh, there are two things here, the rule of sanguinis and the rule of Jusoni. Oh, I, I think it, it has something to do with uh, where you are born and uh, who is your relative. So one of the two. Uh, anyway, let's continue reading. So these are the two uh, rules that deal with you becoming a natural citizen. So a natural citizen who becomes a citizen through being born in a country or parents being born in that country of your own. So it's either you've been born in that country or you have both your parents they are born in that country. So you become a natural citizen. So let's look at this rule of just solely. So in brackets, it means place of birth, or oh, I see. So rule of solely, this is place of birth. This rule states that a person becomes a citizen through the place of birth. So, for example, if you are uh, if Zambian parents living in South Africa, when they give birth to a child, that child is South African by birth. Hence, uh, he or she is a citizen of South Africa. Oh, interesting. So, no wonder sometimes uh, Mexicans, because you know Mexicans just. Uh, Mexico is just by the U.S. border there. So because of this rule of Jasodi or place of death, you find that pregnant Mexicans who are maybe eight to nine months are pregnant, are pregnant, they will illegally cross the border. And once they illegally cross the border, if their child is born in the United States, that child is going to become an American citizen. But the parents, the mother, is not an American citizen. So people can use this uh, strategy to gain citizenship in a foreign country or allow their children to be citizens of that foreign country. I, I've seen this happen um, on the news rather, I haven't seen it live. I've seen this happen in the US-Mexican uh, border. So that's the rule of Jasodi, so place of birth where you are born. If I'm born in Zambia, I'm a Zambian citizen. If my parents are Zambian and they go to South Africa and I'm born in SA at whatever hospital that is in SA, I'll become a South African citizen. If my mother wants a better future for me, uh, she's in Mexico and she's nine months or eight months pregnant and she legally crosses the US border and I, I I become born in the USA, I'll become an American citizen. Interested, huh? Yes. So that's the rule of uh, just solely. 
now the rule of sanguine is oof, the terms that you have to know. Anyway, now you now rule of das sanguine is. So this is blood relation. So this rule states that citizenship depends on blood citizenship. Oh, citizenship. <laughs> Citizenship depends on blood relationship. So this means that citizenship depends on where one's parents were born. For example, Zambian parents living in Zimbabwe, they have uh, the child they have is Zambian because their parents are Zambian. So again, uh, regardless of where you are here, you can even become a dual citizen because this rule uh, the, the rule of just Saudi, you have been born in Zimbabwe. So because of the place of birth, you are Zimbabwean, but your parents are also Zambian. So you automatically become a Zambian and a Zimbabwean at the same time. So in some countries, uh, I was I'm just talking about this just now. I've just mentioned it. In some countries where dual citizenship is allowed and an individual can belong to two countries, through the application of the two rules. So sometimes you can be like, you can become both an American citizen and also a Zambian citizen. I actually know uh, a, uh, a friend of mine who's both an American citizen and a Zambian citizen. And I think another one is a British citizen and a Zambian citizen because their parents are both Zambian, but they were born in Britain at the time. So they came back and got their NRC because uh, both their parents are Zambian. So therefore, uh, when you are a citizen through one of the above rule, and then you are, a nat uh, you are a natural citizen. So what are the two criterias? Your place of birth, uh, your place of birth well, where you, you were born, and uh, who your parents are. So who your parents are, that's the, the rule of just sanguinis, who your parents are, and uh, rule of just soli, uh, where you are born. Maybe this soli, I don't know. You can use a mnemonic. You can say, all right, rule of just soli. All right, soli rhymes with soyo. Soyo is the ground, so maybe ground, uh, place of birth, then the other one will become a blood relation because you like, all right, who your parents are. So you can try to use such a mnemonic, all right, rule of just soli, soil means land, so where you are born, rule of just sanguinis, all right, okay, who your parents are. So that's a natural citizen. So now let's look at the characteristics of a naturalized citizen. So a citizen through certain circumstances. So let's look at those circumstances. First of all, are, are you okay with natural citizen? Yes. All right, you just have to watch the video. Make sure you download it uh, immediately when I send. So naturalized uh, citizen. So a naturalized citizen is a, uh, so these are the, the, the scenarios, so the scenarios. So a naturalized citizen is a foreigner who acquired citizenship of a host country through meeting certain rules. So this is actually a little bit wrong. So a naturalized citizen can either be a foreigner or an alien. So remember a foreigner is someone who Fleed, they ran away from their uh, country because of maybe the rules or the political environment of that country. Then an alien is someone who uh, went to a foreign country for certain reasons, for example, to a reason or work, or they are an expatriate. So these are the criteria. So however, under this rule, there are four major rules or principles of naturalized citizenship. The first one, A, are the rule of residence, the rule of residence. So this is how long have you been in that country? So this states that when an alien leaves, so you've seen they are changing things. No wonder I initially mentioned that 
there's a difference between a foreigner and an alien and they should replace this word here with an uh, alien so i want uh, in the notes i want you to say a naturalized citizen is an alien or foreigner who acquired citizenship of a host country through meeting certain uh, rules you are going to change this definition when writing your notes uh, use the video as an aid so um, okay. one all right good so the rule of residence so this states that so this states that when an alien or a foreigner uh, lives in a host country for a certain period of time he or she can apply to become a citizen of that country if uh, they wish to for example an alien in zambia can apply to be a citizen after living in zambia for 10 years and above so if you are if you've lived in the country for more than 10 years and above and you have passport records that you've actually been here in Zambia for more than 10 years, you can apply for citizenship. So naturalized citizens, these are citizens based on certain circumstances. Circumstance number one, rule of residence, the amount of time period that they have lived in that country. Scenario number two, a marriage so this condition allows a spouse to acquire citizenship of their wife or husband so if uh, an Ameri uh, if i get married to an american because my wife is american i can apply for citizenship also again based on the, the number of uh, years that we've been married are we truly married are we legally married so a host country can demand the evidence of good character build before allowing an alien to have citizenship. So what is the character of your spouse? Uh, do they have uh, good morals? Are they willing to have allegiance towards, their, towards the host country? So they will ask such questions. Uh, also, um, you know, the host country may also find out the, the alien's wealth, the professional skills, you know, a country is like a business. So if they want to allow someone to be a citizen, what is your character? How much money do you have? What type of skills are you going to bring towards uh, the country? Do you speak the language of our country? So they will ask you, they will ask your spouse such questions before they legally become a citizen. So naturalized citizen, these are aliens who acquire citizenship through certain um, uh, circumstances or scenarios. Scenario number one, the rule of residence, whether that's the time that that alien has lived in that host country. Scenario number two, marriage, where your spouse becomes a citizen because you are married to a legal citizen. Then scenario number three, um, principle of declaration on a prescribed form. So this is where you declare that you want to be uh, a citizen. So this requires an alien to fill a prescribed application form and provide necessary uh, documents declaring that he or she wants to apply for citizenship in a host country. So this uh, principle usually applies to foreigners you know, foreigners who have been living in the border for a very long time because they have fled their country uh, based on uh, the political environment and they've been living on a border in a tent in bad conditions for a long time and they haven't, they have, they are living there peacefully, they are following all the rules and regulations at that uh, foreigner camp then they can apply for uh, citizenship. They can fill in certain documents. So that's the principle of declaration on a prescribed form. So the alien uh, must even publish he or her declaration in a, in a daily mail and newspaper. That's a little bit extreme, where you, you actually go on in the post and say I'm a Zambian citizen, but uh, you have to do what you have to do sometimes. So under this principle, the alien can become a naturalized citizen of the country. So you declare that you want to be a citizen of that country, and then you fill in uh, certain documents. 
That's uh, scenario number three. Uh, scenario number four, where you renounce your previous citizenship. Yeah, I don't stand for the rules of this Islamic state. There's a lot of Boko Haram going on. Uh, these Islamic extremists who have got suicide bombers everywhere, and I don't stand for, for these principles. I am done with this Islamic state. I, I just, I renounce my citizenship. So once you renounce your, you renounce your citizenship of a previous country and give reasons why you can apply to be a citizen of a country. So this requires an alien applying for citizenship to give up his or her previous citizenship and take on an oath of allegiance. Allegiance, remember, are you willing to protect your, your new country? So allegiance of the host country. So this is known as expatriation. So where you renounce your previous uh, citizenship and you sign an oath of allegiance, you become uh, an expatriate, uh, expatriation. So a naturalized citizen can either be a partial or complete. So let's look at the differences. So partial citizenship is a type where a citizen uh, does not enjoy all the rights and privileges of that country. So because you've recently denounced your citizenship and you're sort of still in the documentation process, you have signed the documents that you are now uh, a citizen because you denounced your previous citizenship. It's not right and then that you'd be allowed to vote. A certain amount of years uh, has to pass before you can actually vote. Then uh, a complete citizen, uh, a complete citizenship after you've signed the documents, a certain amount of time has, has passed. So now you can enjoy all the rights and privileges uh, in the state. So these are the uh, methods in which someone can become a naturalized citizen, a citizen based on certain circumstances. A, the rule of residence, where you've spent a certain amount of time in that country, B, marriage, where, where your spouse is a, is a, um, a belongs to that country. Uh, C, you declare to be a citizen in that country. This applies to foreigners on, on borders. Or you renounce your previous citizenship. So let's now look at the qualification for a Zambian citizen. So let's now take it to local. What are the Zambian standards? for someone to qualify to be a Zambian citizen. So a person who has been um, ordinarily a Zambian citizen, uh, ordinarily a resident of Zambia, as a foreigner for a continuous period of not less than 10 years can apply for Zambian citizenship. So if you stayed for 10 years and above, you can apply for Zambian citizenship or a person whose parents were born in Zambia. So this is a natural citizen. And this one, the first one, is a naturalized, where uh, you are using the, the, what rule are you using? A rule of time, uh, which one? Which rule are we using? Uh, naturalized, we're using uh, the rule of residence. So the first one here is the rule of residence where you've stayed in Zambia for more than 10 years, and this is the naturalized form, uh, your parents. I think it's the rule of just sanguinis, uh, who your parents are. So a person whose parents were born, natural citizen, or if you've stayed in Zambia for more than 10 years. So uh, what, uh, what is the symbol of citizenship do we use? So we all have this uh, green national registration card that shows that you are actually now a Zambian citizen and you have to be over the age of 16 to get your national registration card here in Zambia. Uh, how can a naturalized citizen, a naturalized citizen lose Zambian citizenship? So acquiring a new, you know, after you've stayed for 10 years or maybe you are married to a Zambian, how can you lose your citizenship? So one, uh, acquiring a new citizenship of another country and renouncing your Zambian citizenship. So you're like, oh, all right, I'll, 
and let's go to a foreign country we're tired of zambia you can renounce your zambian citizenship or if you commit a very serious crime like a crime against the state maybe someone has allowed a, an american citizen to become a citizen in zambia then it's later discovered that actually that person was a spy for the usa so such a scenario or maybe this person is from china and you know it's so discovered that they are a spy who came to spy on the political activities of zambia that's a crime against the state and someone who has been who has become a naturalized citizen can lose their citizenship so how can one lose citizenship in other countries so you are an alien um no, you are a zambian living in the usa how can and you've acquired some form of citizenship there how can you lose citizenship in other countries other than zambia is continuously absent from the home state for long periods of time you just go on holidays or business trips and you are not in the country for a consistent amount of time uh, takes up employment under a foreign government you you've gone to the usa you stayed there in the usa for a long time you've acquired citizenship and then you start applying for jobs elsewhere uh, you can lose your citizenship you get uh, gets married to a foreigner and such a person decides to acquire the citizenship uh, of the spouse so you are a, a citizen uh, of zambia maybe your spouse is a zimbabwean and your spouse decides to be a zambian so you can lose uh, they can say all right i don't want to be a citizen of zimbabwe anymore i'll just become a zambian so qualities of a good citizen so allegiance is, is probably there in, in in one of these you have to be able to defend your own country so let's look at the qualities of a good citizen so one lives up to the democratic principles such as voting honestly you know just because someone has given you a bag of milli meal or, or a hat saying whatever political party then you vote for them that's not good so you have to live up to democratic principles uh, such as voting honestly so be able to contribute towards national development you know are you bringing in knowledge to your country are you starting businesses to employ other people so you have to be able to contribute towards your nat uh, national development you have to have a level of intelligence you know to understand the interests of your community, to understand the written constitution that we have here in Zambia. You have to have some form of self-control. You know, uh, fear, you know, fear to, to do bad things, to vandalize things. You have to have some form of conscience, you know, which means the sense of responsibility uh, towards the community, such as performing all duties of the country, like the allegiance. You have to have some form of courage, you know, the strength to stand without fear when doing the duties of, of your nation. You know, I'm a Zambian citizen. Why should I be afraid of uh, certain foreigners? Uh, you have to respect the law. Above all, respect the rule of law. You have to have some empathy, you know, put your, be able to put yourself in other people's shoes. So having compassion for others, especially the vulnerable. Uh, persevere, uh, perseverance, willingness to attempt several times continuously to accomplish a certain goals. It doesn't matter if you fail multiple times, keep planning, keep persevering. Uh, patriotism, you know, have some love for the country that you belong to. So now let's look at uh, some of the duties and responsibilities of a citizen sorry we, we have to move we have to be able to do these topics at each lecture and i know there'll be a lot of things for you to read for you to write this video will probably be over an hour but we are okay to keep moving now we have to finish this yes let's keep moving we're almost done anyway we are duties of a citizen uh yeah. Yes, 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 yes. All right, we're almost done. We'll end on uh, acknowledgments. 
So what are some of the duties? So the duties and responsibilities are divided into uh, your personal duty towards your, for, towards your country and sort of civic duties towards the state. So personal duties, you know, uh, towards yourself, and this is towards your country, sorry. So personal duties, you have to be able to take care of yourself, uh, supporting one's family, uh, you have to adhere to certain moral principles and uh, values of that society that you are coming from, uh, respecting the rights and interests of others. So these are your personal responsibilities as a citizen. Then you also have civic responsibilities. So civic means responsibilities towards your state or the country that you belong to. So you have to be able to obey the law if they say start wearing masks, there's coronavirus, don't enter shops without a mask, you have to be able to obey that law, even if people don't wear masks. But at least these big shops adhere to these laws, you know, where if you go in shop right, you won't be allowed to enter without wearing a mask. But to Mantemba and Temba here and there, they, no one cares. So paying taxes, you have to be able to pay taxes. Uh, respecting the rights of others, and above all, again, the rule of law, uh, participating in civic activities such as voting, nothing like me, I'm a Jehovah's Witness, you're not doing anyone any, any favor by not voting, this is your country, you have to vote, sorry if you're a Jehovah's Witness. <laughs> Performing public uh, services, you know, if, you, if there's a road out there, if it's sort of you can pick up certain things and uh, maintaining and preserving the security of the nation don't be a thief don't be a vandalizer you know uh, be vigilant maintain and observe the, the security of the nation so now let's look at uh, the factors hindering good citizenship so what are the factors that are hindering someone from practicing good moral uh, duties either either um, individual or civic duties as a good citizen so the first thing is you know poverty someone can bribe you you know someone uh, wants an american citizenship and you work at the national registration uh, uh, place you are giving people nrc's and they offer you $5,000 and you've never even touched a dollar before in your life and you're in poverty. You know, you're going to give someone that NRC. So poverty. So poverty is the state of being poor where citizens um, fail to take an active role in national affairs. So you are, you are poor. Poverty is a hindrance to good citizenship. So uh, vastness, va vast a lot vastness so this means that citizens are given a very little chance in national uh, in national affairs so things are too narrow you know as a citizen maybe you you have interest in uh, becoming a mayor but there are certain things that are sort of a hindra um, standing in your way too many obstacles so ignorance, sometimes people are not so intelligent in having the common sense to be good citizens. So ignorance, the state of failing to differentiate between a right and a wrong. So you just do things because you think you are a Zambian. You go there, you know, the xenophobia that was uh, prevalent in SA. People were banning uh, Zambian citizens or Zimbabwean citizens. Foreigners were being banned because they think we are South Africans, so we have the right to do whatever we want. So they are differentiate, they are failing to differentiate what is right from what is wrong. So ignorance prevents people from being good citizens. Uh, indifference or lack of consciousness. So again, the xenophobia where you don't have much of a conscience, you know, even if you are doing the wrong thing it seems right in your head. So that's what indifference or lack of consciousness is. Something that's wrong, it's clearly wrong to the majority, but in your own head, somehow you're saying, ah, it's the right thing. So individuals being only concerned about their benefit from the state at the expense of others. You don't care about other people. You are like, yeah, 
So this is also the definition of self-interest. They are called narcissists. You don't care about others as long as things go your own way. So a person motivated by self-interest avoids public responsibilities. I just want things to go my way. Uh, other people don't matter. That's what self-interest means. So self-interest prevents you from becoming a good citizen. Uh, the defects in the electoral system, you know, defects in the electoral system where they just say, all right, register, the registration for voting uh, will be one week. How can uh, someone who lives far away prepare for transport? Maybe they don't have access to good uh, new system, so they haven't even heard that there's voters registration. So these are, there are certain defects. So citizens have uh, no confidence in the electoral system, hence no interest to national affairs. They are like, ah, after all, I'm a rigging every time, I'll just be a Jehovah's Witness this year, I won't vote. So misinformation uh, by the media, you know, nowadays we're in the digital age. Um, Social media and the news agencies are designed to have great influence towards people's decisions. And there's a lot of fake news out there. So this fake news can actually, you know, they, they can actually affect the way someone can even vote. So misinformation by the media, newspapers, radio, television, and the internet may twist the facts, fake news. They twist the facts or the information such that citizens cannot get anything correctly or knowledgeable. You know, it's, it's a mixture of information. Is this president good? Is this president bad? Social media can make someone look uh, both good and both bad, and it can um, make someone get confused, like, hmm, should I vote for this person? Should I not? Other people are saying this. Uh, social media is, is saying this. Opera News is showing these weird things about this person. So should I vote? Should I not vote? So because uh, we need solutions, right? So these are the hindrances to good citizenship. So what are some of the remedies that we can use to sort of treat the predisposition of bad citizenship? So this is now this heading that we are at, ways of promoting good citizenship. So the first thing is uh, administrative uh, improvements. When we talk about administration, we're talking about uh, who makes the, uh, the, the rules, who, where, where is the money coming from? So that's the administrative improvement. So this means to reconstruct the political and social institution uh, in order to fulfill the wishes of the citizens. So every time you hear this word here, administrative improvements, it means improving the people who are improving the structures that are making money to, uh, for the citizens. So administration, who is making the money? The people making the money for the country, that's the administration. So this means the uh, restructure, the political and social institution in order to fulfill the wishes of the citizens. Citizens uh, must be well informed about the welfare of the country and must be involved in the constitution process. So you improve these administrative uh, structures. So moral remedies. So citizens must be uh, both spiritually and mentally motivated for them to do the duties of the nation effectively. So education, uh, education, you know, when people are educated, they are able to make more informed decisions. For example, here you are exposing yourself to civic education. It means you'll be able to make much more informed decisions about your country. So stability and justice. So this involves the establishment. This is where you want to be, the stability and justice. So this involves the establishment of security, stability, and justice measures by leaders and citizens. So citizens should carry out community projects for social and economic 
development. You know, maybe a group of women uh, and men come together and say, all right, let's uh, contribute certain uh, uh, funds and money together so that we can go to UTH and sort of buy some food and blankets for the needy, you know, such, such types of projects or stability and justice. So let's now look at our last part of this lecture known as uh, rights and freedoms. Mm -hmm. So rights and freedoms, you know, we, we did say what human rights are. These are just rights just by the, uh, just these are rights uh, based on the fact that you are born your existence automatically grants you those rights and freedoms. So rights are uh, entitlements, this is a much better word. So rights are entitlements of an, an individual by virtue of being human. So this definition is a human rights. So rights are entitlements of an individual by virtue of just you existing, being a human being, you are entitled to certain things. Uh, they are divided into three categories. So rights are divided into three categories, uh, natural rights, moral rights, and legal rights. So let's look at uh, all these individually. So natural rights, uh, which are enjoyed by individuals in the state of nature, such as the right to life. So just by you um, existing, you have a natural right to life. So you also have moral rights. So moral rights are those acknowledged by the moral sense of the community and hence are not legal. So they're just moral rights. Uh, for example, a teacher has the moral rights to be respected by the pupils and the community at large. So moral based on um, the culture and state of uh, being that you have even age, you have a moral right, you know, the elderly have to be respected, so we have moral rights to respect our elders. Uh, legal rights, so are those privileges given by your citizenship, so the government of the, of the nation. So any violation of legal action can be taken. The police and the judiciary ensure that your legal rights are enforced. And let's look at uh, the three different types of legal rights. So legal rights, these are rights uh, best, uh, these are rights granted to you by belonging to a particular state as a citizen. So they can be legal rights, can be civil rights, political rights, or economic rights. So these civil rights, you know, the rights to personal safety and freedom, uh, rights to family, education, prosperity, judicial, etc. You look at this table properly. Uh, political rights, like you know, the right to vote, and economic rights. You know, you have to be able to work. You have to have an adequate minimum wage and reasonable working hours. Again, remember there there can be special types of uh, groups that enjoy certain rights of the country, but not all the rights of that country. So let's look at some of these uh, special groups that enjoy certain rights, but not all the rights. So there are groups of people with special needs, such as refugees, unemployed youths, uh, children, street kids, and also orphans. Although there are a lot of street kids in Zambia, so most of these special groups are actually neglected. So for example, the only example here that has been given is refugees, and let's see if it continued. Uh, no. So refugees. So refugees, a refugee is a person uh, as a result of fear or persecution, they left their country. So the countries where foreigners are found are known as uh, asylum countries. So if a foreigner is living in Zambia, that foreigner considers Zambia as the asylum country. But if you're an alien going there for tourism or work, you consider that country as your host country. But if you're a foreigner, you consider that country as your asylum uh, country. And you are going to enjoy certain freedoms of that country, but you won't have 
uh, the right to maybe vote. So you won't have the full freedoms unless those things that we talked about, the criteria that will enable someone to become a naturalized citizen. So I want you to apply these special groups to the naturalized um, uh, citizens. So we are done for today's lecture. It was very intense, very, very intense, but you have to be able to uh, write down the notes. So this summarizes uh, governance in Zambia and uh, citizenship. So I will send this video immediately. Immediately I send this video. I want you to start uh, to download it, then find time to start writing down the notes with the aid of this video. Yeah, okay? Yes. All right, uh, I'll see you tomorrow for physics. All right, see you tomorrow. Uh, bye. Okay. Have a good day.